If you haven't registered for HomebrewCon yet, do yourself a favor. Head over to homebrewcon.org and click the register button. You'll be so glad you did. HomebrewCon is where the awesome community of brewers gather for three days of learning, camaraderie, and great beer. It's an experience unlike any other. Visit homebrewcon.org and get registered. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 11th, 2017. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Phil Nagash from the podcast My Life as a Foodie talks about the restart of his food podcast and his venturing into making kombucha, that mysterious, tart, fermented tea. If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. Don't forget to get a copy of our brewer's logbook. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. You can find me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. We have a Basic Brewing radio and video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first and click on our associate link on the right-hand side of basicbrewing.com. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you the show, and we greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Am- uh, Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry Podcast Directory. We're on the Stitcher app. We're in Google Play Music, and we're on the uh, iHeartRadio app as well. If you uh, want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our virtual guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. And, and many thanks to everybody who's done so already, gone above and beyond the call. Uh, the countdown to Homebrew Con in Minneapolis is on, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show there, just a little more than a month to go. And uh, I have some exciting news. I talked yesterday to Kevin Welch of uh, Boom Island Brewing in Minneapolis. Kevin and his wife, Chu Sha, run this uh, small Belgian-based or Belgian-style-based uh, 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 brewery. Uh, it uh, turns out that Kevin wants to brew a version of my sorghum Belgianish uh, ale, my sorghum syrup ale, uh, on their pro system. He saw the video on basicbrewingvideo.com or uh, probably on YouTube and was fascinated with it. And he wants to brew uh, a version of that sorghum ale uh, on his system and serve it at HomebrewCon. I'll have uh, more details about that uh, in a later episode. Uh, but it's very exciting. Things are shaping up to be a lot of fun as, around that. And I'm very flattered that uh, Kevin, and a little a little anxious to tell you the truth, you know, my, whenever somebody wants to scale up one of my uh, homebrew recipes, I'm like, mm, how they, mm. <laughs> hope it works out. <laughs> it's good at five gallons, but, you know. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, but, but I, I have confidence that Kevin will do a great job. And uh, I'm fascinated to hear more about uh, about uh, the the brewery up there, Boom Island Brewing. Uh, they have a fascinating story, uh, and I'm sure that we'll we'll have a chance to talk to them about that in Minneapolis. Uh, so anyway, uh, very excited about that, and uh, looking forward even more to Homebrew Con. Phil and I talked for a good long time this week, so I want to get to that quickly. But uh, first, I want to talk about our sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. They have moved into their new space at 6808 South Memorial Drive, and they're celebrating with a grand opening on Saturday, May 20th from noon to 4. Uh, the tap room will be open, serving homebrew. There will be a live band, and uh, Oklahoma's Munch Company food truck will be serving street tacos. And uh, rumor has it that I'll be there as well. So, <laughs> man, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and so, so what else do you need? You know, you got food, you got music, you got homebrew. Well, how about a discount code for Basic Brewing Radio listeners to save seventy-five dollars off of a high gravity brewing uh, system or a Werthog electric brewery controller? The seventy-five bucks off. Just enter the code E B C seven five B B. That's Electric Brewery Controller 75 Basic Brewing, basically, EBC75BB, 
to save $75 on your new system or controller. You can contact Desiree and Dave for more details if you have any questions there. So, if you're going to be in the Tulsa area Saturday, May 20th, from noon to 4, stop on by and say hi. And uh, remember that Basic Brewing discount code EBC75BB to use on family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, Phil Nagash and I have been corresponding for several years uh, I've enjoyed his uh, informative, entertaining, and, and, and frankly, often irreverent podcast, <laughs> depending on the subject matter, <laughs> my life as a foodie, uh, for a long time. And uh, I've wondered how to have a good reason to have him on the show. So in his latest episode, Phil talked about his introduction into making kombucha. So I seized the opportunity to get back into making kombucha and to get in touch with Phil. Phil Nagash, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me, James. I feel like I've known you for years, uh, even though this is the first time that you and I have talked, uh, you know, in a duplex way. <laughs> right. You know, we've we've uh, we've heard each other's voices over the years, and we have written to each other uh, via email back and forth. Uh, but this is the first time that we've had a chance to get together, and I'm I'm real happy about it. Me too. It's it's an absolute honor to be here today. I, I've been listening to you for years, and uh, like I was telling my wife, I was so excited when you contacted me, and she says, uh, she goes, why are you so excited? I go, are you kidding me? This is like being invited to the Johnny Carson show. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Doc, what about those yeah. pants? <laughs> <laughs> Sarnak says? Yes. Uh, sis boom ba. <laughs> what is the sound of an exploding sheep? Uh, <laughs> See, it feels just like Carson. Yeah. Oh, okay. Enough of that. Uh, your show is My Life as a Foodie. And uh, you kind of, you, you, you took a hiatus. You went off the air, but now you're back. So I did. So where'd yeah, you I go? Started. What happened? Well, what happened was this. I started the show 2007. And uh, it evolved into um, something that I really fell in love with, and I enjoyed it a lot immensely. Um, my wife, Katrina, was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2010, and I wasn't very public with any of this. In fact, you know, I, I kind of kept my personal life rather close to the bone for the most part, and I didn't talk about it much, and it became, it started to weigh on me, you know, that I was spending a lot of time on the show and her, and the show became... Um, somewhat therapeutic during that period of time. And uh, she, you know, went through extensive chemotherapy and surgeries and radiation, the whole thing. And uh, she got she got through it, and she was cancer-free for about six months. It came back in mm -hmm. um, 2012 in spring, and things got progressively worse for her. So in October of, of 2012, my show was approaching 100 episodes, and I thought that that might be... Uh, kind of a sign for me to back away and that, you know, I needed to spend more time with her. And it, it hurt a lot to do that, to give up the show, but I was doing it for the right reasons, I thought. So I did. And uh, I bowed out gracefully. And, um, you know, my, my, my audience was upset, but they understood and they felt for me and I got just amazing support from them. And um, it was um, kind of a, a, a sweet and sour, a, a sweet and sour moment at the same time. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. So I did, um, and she. I'm glad I did it at the time because she got sicker and sicker, and then uh, we. She lost her battle in uh, May of 2013, and uh, I came back for one more episode to kind of explain everything that had happened, and uh, I think I did another episode after that. Some there was a baker, a local baker that wanted to uh, promote her her bakery, so I came back for that, and um, then after a while. Uh, I started to miss this. You know, I started to miss what I was doing. And there was kind of a, an empty hole, that a, a space that I couldn't fill. And I didn't know what it was. And I finally realized that it was this. It was talking about food and, and being part of the, um, the podcasting culture. And, um, and I just really enjoy talking about food. I enjoy talking anyway, James. I'm a motor mouth. So, <laughs> you know, not having a vehicle to do that kind of killed me. So, and I thought that, you know, Looking back at it, Katrina would probably be proud that I did that. 
And uh, I do have a lot to talk about. I have a lot of different things to talk about now. So um, I'm glad to be back. My audience um, accepted me back with open arms, and they're very excited. And uh, I'm happy to be back. And I'll tell you something else. I'm happy I came back because now I've been invited on your show, which <laughs> is huge. <laughs> It's not that big of a deal. Uh, okay. You keep telling yourself that. <laughs> My wife tells me that, so, you know, why should I not believe her? <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I was very, very sorry to hear about your loss, and uh, but you have not only got a fresh start to your podcast, you've also got a fresh start in your personal life as well. And right. uh, I don't know how much you want to go into that, but, but part of... Uh, your latest episode is talking about not only kombucha, which we're going to eventually get to, uh, but uh, talking about uh, kids and cooking for kids and how it's a little tougher than you thought it would be. <laughs> yeah, it is. I um, I met this woman who I it, it hit me like a lightning bolt. I didn't expect to meet somebody like this uh, as quickly as I did. I met her um, within a year of uh of katrina's passing and she had children and first question she asked me was have you ever dated anyone with kids before and i said i haven't dated anyone in 25 years so <laughs> and i thought you know my kids my friends all had kids i thought well, i've been uncle phil all these years how tough could this be i had no idea james i was <laughs> so naive i was so naive when we did finally start dating i just thought you know what i'm a great cook i'll cook all this fancy food for them they'll love it and that's just not the case and it has been extremely difficult. Um, kids are a different different type of food critic. Let me just say that. Um, it is difficult sometimes to get them to eat certain things and keep them healthy. Hmm. So, But I'm very lucky because um, Michelle, uh, we're now married, uh, and I'm now their stepfather. Michelle, my wife, um, she she's raised them right. These kids will pluck vegetables out of the ground and eat them raw. Hmm. So... Yeah, I've got a great um, experience with them and eating healthy. Um, it's just, you know, how romantic is it to set out a plate of raw vegetables and say, well, here you go. You know, you, you can't just do that, you, for, at least for me. And it's more about me, James, because I'm, you know, kind of a narcissist in this way. It's got to be, uh, you know, it, it, it's got to be exciting. It's got to be fun. I've, I've got to put a smile on their face with what I cook. And I've been successful at times and unsuccessful at others. And so uh, it's been a challenge. And I found that the best way to do this is to gently bring them into it. Show them, you know, some of your gourmet stuff a little bit at a time. Um, and if it's something they don't like, no big deal. You move on to the next thing. Um, but it's been um, it's been a new experience. And uh, I think I could do a set of podcasts on cooking for kids. I barely scratched the surface. Well, I think there would be a lot of people out there who'd be grateful for some guidance and some tips and some recipes, you know, that, that kids would yeah. would like to eat. So that might be a, a, a rich vein to uh, mine, so to speak. Um, yeah. but, but before we get too far down the road, just just one more in delving into your personal life, Phil. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I feel like I'm about to be depantsed here. This is, is <laughs> this is your life. Uh, <laughs> no, this wait. is your life as a foodie. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Good branding there. Uh, I, I teased in the last episode that you have an Arkansas connection, and it is uh, remarkably close uh, to where I'm standing right now. Yeah, it is. Actually, I grew up in uh, Farmington. Actually, uh, I went to high school in Farmington, which is just down the highway from Prairie Grove. It is literally so, between me and Steve Wilkes. Steve lives on the, the western edge of Fayetteville. And I live in uh, Prairie Grove, and so Farmington is smack dab in the middle there. Yeah, my family migrated um, from New York in the 50s to California, and I was basically born in California, raised here until I was 13. In uh, 78, we moved to Fayetteville, and I lived with my aunt and uncle for a year. Um, I attended uh, Woodland Junior High School in Fayetteville, and uh, that lasted uh, one year before my mother uh, was able to buy a house. And uh, we moved to Farmington, 79, and I went to high school there. And uh, 83, when I graduated, uh, I wanted to, you know, study to, uh, to be a photojournalist. I wanted to get into journalism with my brother. And so I moved back out here to California to go to school, and I stayed. And people wonder why I don't sound like I come from Arkansas. And, <laughs> you know, and I, here's, what the, here's the thing. The minute we got there, and 
I don't know what it is, but in the South, if you don't sound like you're from the South, you're from somewhere else. We sound like we're from New York. So the first thing we got was, you're a Yankee. Mm -hmm. So I get called a Yankee all the time. And uh, it got frustrating. And I don't know what it is about it, but maybe the only thing I picked up from Arkansas in my dialect is the word y'all. I can't drop it. <laughs> That's a I tell. Do all the, I, That's... I do it all the time. It's a tell, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my, my wife, uh, who grew up here in Prairie Grove, uh, said that uh, a, a, a Yankee is, is, not, is not always a uh, derogative term. But, uh, you know, someone from the north moved to town and in her grade school, and she one of the, their favorite things was to make her say T-E-N. Uh, because she didn't say ten, she said tan. <laughs> 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 say it again, say it again. Damn. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, yeah. So there, there you go. That's well. It's funny. We graduated in the same year, and uh, you know, I I tend uh, not to sound like I'm from Arkansas most of the time because no, you, know, you don't. Broadcasting uh, whip that out of me. Uh, if you know, if you're trying to be a professional broadcaster in in today's uh, day and age, and you know, you listen to yourself on a tape. Uh, you know, thousands of times, you eventually, you know, smooth all those rough edges out. And it's it's a, it's a sad thing, really, in my opinion, because, uh, right. you know, my kids don't sound like they're from the South and they were born here. So, uh, you know, and that, I blame the TV. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so so here we are ten and a half minutes into the show and we haven't talked about our topic yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this is a selfish pleasure for me because uh, uh, I kind of wanted to let people kind of get to know you so that they would, you know, kind of try out your, your show and and because uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you use more dirty words than I do, uh, you know, which is fine. Uh, so a little warning if you're, you know, listening with the kids. Um, yeah, <clears throat> but, I, get, uh, I, get, I get emails all the time. I get this every episode that I do. This woman will email me every time. Tell me, I don't know what I'm talking about. I use foul language. I'm retarded. Uh, everything <laughs> under the book. And I email her back. I go, Mom, why do you keep listening to my show? <laughs> Boom. Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so... <laughs> so part of part of the reason that you got into kombucha was that you were uh trying to lead a more healthy uh lifestyle right and you kind of weaned yeah. yourself off of beer uh not entirely i'm telling i'm telling your story for you but yeah. part of the the reason why you got into to kombucha was kind of to scratch an itch right correct yeah really I needed uh, I needed something. Here's the thing. With me, it became uh, an everyday occurrence for me to, to have a beer. And I started to – it was concerning to me that, you know, this was become such a habit that becomes hard to break over time because you get so used to it. And I needed something else to replace that. And the closest thing that I could find to that happened to be kombucha. And like I said on my show, to reiterate, um, sometimes some kombuchas remind me of Lambic. Mm. And – I love Lambic. It's that sour effervescence, and um, there's something to that. So kombucha comes very close to that for me, and it is healthy. It has, does have a lot of health benefits. A lot are unfounded, but um, I think a lot of them are, are very good, and uh, it's something healthy instead of something unhealthy. Yeah, and if you're into probiotics, uh, like I take a, a probiotic pill every morning. I don't know if it does any good or not, but uh, we know it can sour beer. Uh <laughs> So there is yeah. active stuff in there, but uh, you know there is probiotics in this in this stuff. But but it is number one. It is expensive. I mean, these I'm, I've just poured me a pint of GT's uh, organic and raw uh, kombucha, original flavor, uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, the sixteen ounce bottle, or what is that in mill or let's see four hundred and eighty milliliters. It was like three dollars and eighty cents. And that's, you know, that's not cheap in my book. No, uh, when, when you compare it to beer, I don't think it's that bad. But, I mean, it, it is still, it's tea. So, uh, so you know, being a home brewer, uh, you know, making your own is a good way uh, to not only cut cost, but to, you know, put your own spin on it. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, it's something like, this is one of the things I love about home brewing. 
um, is that you'll hand someone a beer, someone that maybe doesn't even know you. You hand them a beer and they taste it. You go, this is good. What is this? And you say, I made it. They freak out. You made this? And all of a sudden it becomes this big thing that, you know, they want to know how to do this now. And all of a sudden you're adding to the brotherhood of home brewing. Uh, I think it's the same thing with this. People don't make kombucha at home, not too many people. So when you hand something like this to them and it's crafted, you did it yourself. You know, I think as artisans, we we love doing this because we love sharing our experiences. So, yeah, I think there's, I mean, as easy as this is, I mean, it's a lot easier than making beer, really. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I'm tasting it now, and it's nice and tart. Uh, so if you like sour beers, if you like tart beers, it'll, like I say, it'll scratch that itch as well. Um, it's just kind of a, a, a it's a little bit sweet. It's not as sweet as some kombuchas uh, that I've had. Um, but it's nice. It's nice and clean. It's kind of like just a basic tea, uh, but with a tartness and a carbonation to it that makes it really pleasant. So very, very sure. nice job on the on the original GT's uh, kombucha. So what? That's, that's great. So take take us through the steps. How do you how, how did you start on making your own? Okay, so I read a lot of stuff online, and there's varied opinions and recipes and how to do it. But the most basic recipe that I found called for uh, basically to make one gallon of tea. And actually, I cut it down to half a gallon because I wasn't sure if I was going to screw this whole thing up. I didn't want to spend too much time and expense. Um, but basically, it was one gallon of of water, anywhere from ten to twelve tea bags. Um, that you basically you steep it. And I, th- I think I steeped it at like 120 degrees the first time. And I let it steep overnight because I like strong tea. I wanted it to be full. So I let that steep overnight, strained it. I added one cup of sugar. And then, uh, actually, I'm sorry. I did the one cup of sugar with the water. So the whole thing was sweetened uh, overnight. And then uh, strained that. I put that into my, uh, my vessel that I was going to ferment this in. I added uh, two cups of vinegar which brings the pH of the water down. The, the pH obviously is important. You don't want to, you know, the pH has to be a certain level of uh, bacteria will go nuts. And then uh, I added my SCOBY, which I ordered uh, off of Amazon the first time, not knowing that I was going to be growing SCOBYs from here on out. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, go so, ahead. So we, we have to say that SCOBY is a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. Uh, yeah. And it looks like a gelatinous pancake, basically. Yeah, a really squishy pancake. And it actually contains uh, Saccharomyces, right? Is that is that how I pronounce this? Yeah. Um, I've got a list on, on this uh, on this other, where was it? The uh, uh, This other bottle of kombucha from Buddha's Brew. It lists, and I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to pronounce any of these right, but glu- Glucano said... Bacter, Xylanus, Zygosaccharomyces baili, Decara bruxellensis, so that sounds like a uh, Brett, Decara <laughs> anomala, and Pichia membranifaciens. <laughs> well, you drink, are you drinking tea or a science experiment? Seriously. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no chemicals. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, right. It's all natural. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of stuff. I mean, it, it is a colony of, of this stuff, and, you know, you're not really sure what's in there. But, you know, obviously there's souring bugs in there, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, it, it ferments the sugar. So there's got to be some yeast in there that, that does that. Uh, so it's this colony of stuff that you put in the tea, and it, and it ferments. How long did it, did it take uh, for yours to ferment? Yeah, here's the other thing. So it takes at least 10 days. And I, one of the jokes about people who brew kombucha is they get really impatient. You're constantly checking it. You want it to be finished. Uh, mine took about four. I, I, I gave it a good 14 days before I pulled it. And what I was left with was a very clean white um, new scoby along the top that um, – was perfect. It tasted. Now, mine came out. I added a little bit more sugar than I should have because I happen to like sweet tea. So mine came out very, very sweet um, when I bottled it, but it still had that tanginess to it. Uh, it wasn't as it wasn't a, like a lot of the kombuchas you buy on the shelf. They're they're very light. They're very, you know, uh, sparkly. Mm-hmm. Mine was was deep bodied, very sweet, uh, still very sparkly because, you know, I left it in the bottle for, I think, 10 days before I tried it. And um, no, that's the recipe. Gallon of water. You know, a cup of sugar, 10 bags of tea, two cups of vinegar, done. 
Now, some people don't use vinegar. Uh, you might want to do it with your first batch for sure, either that or what I did was uh, – <clears throat> and it's been so long. It's been if – you, if you go on YouTube and search for basic brewing and kombucha – you can see – you can not only see us make uh, kombucha from uh, a scoby that someone gave me uh, locally here, uh, but you'll also see me with more hair and it'll be brown, which is was kind of a shock to me. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so kombucha makes you old, I found out. Uh, it takes years to do it, but it'll make you old. Um, but uh, but the process that that I did was I had a little bit of the the scoby from the previous person or the uh, the kombucha from the previous person, so that is acidic in itself, and yeah. so you know that lowers the pH. And then then once you um, once you get a healthy scoby uh, of your own on top, then you can harvest uh, most of the kombucha. And still leave some behind, which, again, is going to be acidic. And then you put fresh tea on top of that. And, uh, you know, since there's going to be so much uh, of the organisms in there from that fresh scoby or mother, as some people call it, you know, it'll probably take off in plenty, in, in, in short order. And, you know, you'll have less of a concern about mold and, and, and such as that. Um, so with each batch, do you still use uh, the vinegar in there? So I have been using... Um... At least the very the very first batch I used white distilled vinegar, and then for the, the rest of the batches I still had a little bit of leftover uh, of starter tea that I kept. So yeah, I started using the starter tea after I I did my first batch. Now I think there was a I don't know there was a, a flux that I hadn't brewed kombucha in I think like a month. So I left I had my scoby stored in the starter culture, but there wasn't enough of starter tea to actually start up another batch. So I started using vinegar again until I started getting back into it. So I think for the very first batch, if you don't have kombucha or a, or a uh, starter tea to, to actually use, you know, use white distilled vinegar for your first batch, and then you can start using your own tea. What I did, uh, because I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, have a SCOBY of my own anymore, uh, and I didn't want to order one on Amazon. I had read that you can make your own scoby from scratch, sort of like uh, harvesting the dregs of yeast from a bottle-conditioned uh, bottle of beer. Mm -hmm. So this uh, this GT's uh, Organic and Raw Original Kombucha, if you look in the bottom of it, and I took some pictures and I put it on, uh, uh, on Facebook.com slash Basic Brewing, there's this little slug in the bottom of the... <laughs> <laughs> that was disgusting. Yeah, yeah. You know, you could make all kinds of expectoration jokes there, uh, but uh, there's a, there's a slug of stuff in the bottom that uh, you actually want. Um, I mean, it's not it's not necessary uh, to grow your own kombucha. The bugs, you know, could be floating around in a, in in a bottle that doesn't have the slug. Um, mm. But what I did was I followed your recipe on my life as a foodie um, website. Your website. And uh, instead of the of the vinegar, I just poured the whole uh, sixteen ounce um, kombucha bottle in there with the dregs, with the slug. Um, and at first, I put an I, I got a fancy new uh, jar from Steve at Steve's Brew Shop, and and it has an, a, a hole in the lid for an airlock. So I put the lid on, and I put the airlock in there. And then I got feedback from people saying, "No, don't don't do the airlock. The the stuff needs oxygen in order to you know make its pellicle or make the the scoby." So after you know a couple of days, I took off the lid and I replaced that with a just a paper towel with a rubber band around it. So what what do you use? I use a, a tiny bit of cheesecloth, but it's got m multiple layers, so it's not just a single sheet of cheesecloth that something can get into the. Uh, the container with. So it's a, a pretty good sized piece of cheesecloth. It's, well, I think I've folded it about three or four times. And so air still gets in, oxygen still gets in. It's wrapped with a rubber band and uh, that works perfectly. I think a Scott towel will be fine. If you want to use a paper towel, uh, you could double it up. Um, just any, nothing too fine that, you know, something can get inside. Uh, I, as much as I say I love Lambic, I, I once watched a video on uh, this old farm in Belgium and this guy was brewing Lambic and I think he had the Lambic in there for like a year or something 
It was just ridiculous. And there were spiders and cobwebs and all sorts of stuff growing in it. I think rats were coming by and, and taking, there were rat turds in it. And I'm like, people drink this stuff? I may never drink Lambic again. <laughs> Not recommended uh, procedure. <laughs> Not for me. Um, is it <laughs> One of the things I looked at all the flavors, you know, and there's a ton of different flavors, and not a lot of them appealed to me. Uh, basically, at the store, I went to Whole Paycheck or Whole Foods. Uh, we have one in Northwest Arkansas now. We're all uptown. Um, but um, one thing that appealed to me this this uh, Buddha's Brew kombucha comes with one that's flavored with hops. Um, and st- I took it to uh, Steve's brew shop afterwards, and we tasted it. And it says it has uh, organic cascade, citra, and palisades hops in there. Uh, and we actually thought it was really, really good. Um, the We got a really fresh hop character from it. Uh, they must have dry hopped them because uh, I, it was kind of like tasting what you smell when you're at like a hop cutting and there's like a bale of fresh hops there. You know, it was kind of... A little grassy, but, you know, you get the hop character coming through those, you know, those um, kind of piney and citrusy hop characters. So, uh, you know, that's one that, that I'm going to use as an inspiration. Uh, but uh, but there are all kinds of different flavors of stuff. And, you, Phil, you found some, some hop-flavored uh, kombucha as well. I did, actually. I found one from uh, Townshend's Tea Company. Um, it's called Brew Doctor, and it says uh, citrus hops. Now, I found this stuff. Um, it's available all over the place. Um, I've actually found it in a few places in Arkansas. If people are interested. There's a Fresh Market in Little Rock. It's available at Natural Foods in Searcy. And uh, what's this place called? Truck something. I can't remember. Maybe my, boy, my writing has gotten really bad. It's in Jonesboro. <laughs> yeah, just you can go to their website and check it out. But anyway, it's a citrus hop. So um, I bought a couple bottles. And uh, I tried one with my wife. Now, here's the deal. So in, this says it's got citrus hops, organic, uh, organic hops, but they also use uh, oranges and coriander. So I almost wondered if they were trying to emulate a wit of some kind. Hmm. So I cracked it and tasted it, and I swear to you, I couldn't smell hops or taste hops in this. But it was super refreshing. And, of course, my wife went nuts for it because it was refreshing to her. She's not a hop fan to begin with. So... The the kombucha that you just described is exactly what I'm looking for uh, and the kind of thing that I would try to emulate myself. And I think you're right. I think the best way to do this, if you're going to try this at home, would be to dry hop it or at the very least, uh, if you were going to do some form of secondary fermentation, maybe put the fresh hops in there. Uh, obviously, it would have to be low acid hops mm-hmm. and um, maybe, I don't know, try it for a week. And again, on... A recommended dose. I don't know how much you'd want to put in there, but I'm guessing uh, maybe 12 gallon or sorry, 12 gallons, 12, 12 grams per gallon. Yeah, 12 gallons of hops to a gallon will pretty much do it. <laughs> and thus, Phil was uh, revealed to be a sham. With a yes. <laughs> Well, I can tell you what not to do, uh, because I thought, you know, I was all inspired by this 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 hopped uh, kombucha that, uh, you know, when I came home and I was making my tea, I said, well, I'll just make a little uh, a little hop extract here and I'll just pour it in with the tea, you know, and uh, and and away we go. So what I did was I, I took an ounce of Cascade pellets and I I took some boiling water, like a cup of boiling water. And uh, I got one of those tea filters that you use with um, with loose tea, and I put the hops in there, and I poured the hot water on top of that. And the first thing that happened was the hops swelled up and clogged all the pores in the little filter. So, <laughs> oh, nice, perfect. So, so that was a failure. So I used a spoon to to press out, you know, the water from the hops, and that took a while, you know, because I would like press them out, and then I would dig them back up to kind of loosen them up and put more water in there and press it out. And so, you know, I I put this cup of of hot tea or hop tea uh, to my lips and I tasted it and it about blew my head off. The bitterness was <laughs> was pretty.
pretty incredible. Now you, and you boiled this, right? Yeah, well, I put boiling water in there, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm an idiot, I guess. I get, it's, like, it's like I've never brewed before. Uh, you know, it, it, it turns out that, that, that boiling water isomerizes uh, the alpha acids in hops and uh, extracts the bitterness. So um, I wound up pitching that but, or throwing it away because it was just too bitter. I thought if I had this, even this little cup of, of this in my half gallon of tea, it's going to be way bitter. And right. bitterness is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, you know, hop flavor uh, and hopefully aroma. So uh, when my tea is finished, uh, you know, and I'm now seeing activity, I'm not seeing the SCOBY, you know, I'm not seeing a pellicle on the top yet. I am seeing the the slug of snotty looking stuff. It is growing in there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, and there, there's little bubbles around the side and all that. So there's activity in there. So I feel confident that I'm on the right track. But I think we're what so, I'll... Ad, so, so adventurous that we're drinking something that looks like it has snot and a slug in it. <laughs> yeah. I, I try not to think about it too much. But the, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so what what I think I'll do is once it's it's soured uh, to, uh, you know, the level that I like, I think I'm going to rack it into. Uh, into a, a secondary fermenter like a Mr. Beer uh, fermenter or something like that, and then dry hop it in there, you know, with hops in a uh, in a little hop bag or something. But uh, I'm hoping that, that that in that way I'll be able to get you know more fresh hop flavor uh, rather than you know that that strong bitterness that I experienced uh, with what I originally did. I'm definitely going to experiment with this myself and uh, play around. And once I get it nailed, I'm sure you'll get it nailed long before I do. Uh, I'm just going to copy you like I do everything else. <laughs> Boy, I'm I'm I'm, t- I'm tasting the um, Buddha's Brew ginger now, and boy, you know I like ginger and I like Marianne since Steve is not here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is that an ongoing debate between you two? Oh yeah. Well, whenever we mention ginger, we've got to mention Marianne as well. But yeah. Uh, so this is really good. Uh, I like uh, the ginger character is very fresh. Uh, the tartness is still there. Um, it's not as carbonated as the uh, the other one, uh, but it's nice. And I, you know, ginger would be another good thing uh, to use to flavor your teas with. Um, but uh, have you ventured into flavoring these, or, or do you just use different kinds of teas? So I have used a bunch of different teas, but the one that I've really started to like that I've done myself is uh, I got white tea. Now, I got this from the specialty tea shop, and it's basically just white tea leaves, and I don't use a lot of it because I want it to be a very light tea. Uh, and I'll brew the kombucha as I normally do, but I'll add lemon wedges, and slices of fresh ginger to it, mm-hmm. and it said. And when I sweeten it, I sweeten it with honey instead of sugar. Ah, so it's got just an amazing crisp, fresh flavor. Now, now I started brewing this, and it wasn't even summer yet. I'm sure this summer, uh, that's going to be one of my go-to's. Um, but in regards to actually kombucha that I've tried to uh, emulate, um, there is one, and I do want to mention it only because um, it was one of the very first kombuchas that that made a difference to me. Uh, the company's called Kombucha Dog, and they're based here in California. It was started by this man named Michael Fay, who was a photographer, a very good studio portrait photographer. And what he does with this, and he brews amazing kombuchas in all different flavors, um, but on each label of his kombucha is a picture of a dog. And it turns out that these dogs are all up for adoption. Hmm. So, and, and the money that he makes from you know his kombucha business uh, helps uh, this rescue that has all these dogs, and he helps rescue these dogs. So if you're drinking a bottle of kombucha that has this cute dog on it, you fall in love with the dog. Uh, you can go online. They have a, a whole database of dogs that are available for adoption, and then you can kind of um, you know show your interest in adopting this dog. And I just thought this is one of the most heartfelt, sincere, um, and uh, really kind of a humanistic approach to and it's just like, you know, the, the beer industry, craft beer industry is one of the greatest because uh, everybody's always helping out somebody or somebody else. And um, I, it's great to see something like this. So, yeah, uh, kombucha, yeah, kombucha dog. Now, do you add your flavoring post fermentation or do you put it in there with the tea when you're when you add the scoby or how do you handle that? Yeah. So there's a second part of it. Yeah. So if you're going to brew, like, let's say you just brew a standard white tea or if you want to brew something that's got uh, maybe lemon in it or something and you want to go a little uh, direction further. So when I'm bottling it, 
instead of adding, because I normally will add a little bit of sugar to the bottle, so it'll help the carbonation. That's when I'll add fruit juice. And I'll usually squeeze it myself because I want to make sure that, it, you know, it's, I know where that fruit comes from. And I'll either do blueberries. Sometimes I'll do raspberries. Uh, I've juiced, um, I'll, I've juiced everything. I've juiced uh, apples. Uh, I'll juice strawberries. And I'll just play around with those juices. Now, sometimes you want to do is kick it up a little bit with some corn sugar if you want to make it a little bit sweeter. But that, that fruit flavoring added to a tea that uh, where it won't compete with those flavors, that's why I'll use like a, a white-based tea and go from there. That is, um, that's been another thing. Seriously, the sky's the limit with this stuff. You can, you can really just uh, free ball it and, and, you know, play around until you find something that really works for you. Now, the, we have to say that, uh, that if you are uh, bottle conditioning these, you probably got to take the same approach that you do when you do your own uh, root beer uh, and bottle condition your own root beer, you know, with a lot of sugar in it. Uh, the yeast can get carried away, and you can have bottle bombs. Uh, so, you know, it may be good to either bottle in, say, PET bottles that you can squeeze and see if they're getting tight, um, or, you know, check your bottles every now and then to see what the carbonation level is at. And then once it reaches that carbonation level that you like, put it in the refrigerator, get it nice and cold, and, and hopefully slow down the yeast from, from fermenting and, and getting over-carbonating and then blowing up. Right, yeah, which results in divorce in some cases. <laughs> knock, knock wood, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, cool. Uh, now, I put these, these photos out there, uh, and uh, it, one of the, the things I like about this, this whole thing is that, you know, it's interactive. You put some stuff on the Internet, and people say, well, I've done it this way, or I've done it this way, you know. So uh, I'm going to read a few of these comments or look at a few of these comments. First of all, uh, Brandon wrote in that, uh, that he did an experiment that he put on YouTube where he made his own starter, his own SCOBY, from several different flavors and different brands uh, and then compared them. So if you want to see that, uh, go to the YouTube channel called Now It's Time for Beer, all one word. Uh, oh. And you can see Brandon there doing his experiment, uh, which is really cool. Uh, he found that uh, there was a mango-flavored uh, uh, kombucha that was that was the best. Uh, so your mileage may vary on that. Um, but uh, he, <laughs> he said there's one of the videos in this three-video series that he posted – uh, and you can find the link uh, on the in the discussion of uh, you know this on our on our Facebook page. But uh, one of the things is why not to use cheesecloth when making kombucha? And I guess he used just like one layer of the cheesecloth and and some like fruit flies or something got in there. Oh no! Oh dear! <laughs> wow! So that's How'd back that to your that's back to your lambic uh, uh, discussion. Uh, <laughs> So use enough – if you are using cheesecloth, fold it over enough times where the, the flies aren't going to make their way in there. Yeah. Um, Al uh, – and I guess I could use people's uh, last names on there, but uh, uh, if you want to see their last names, go to the page. Uh, Al says, uh, I've had success with the same brand that I use, this GT's uh, original kombucha. I enjoyed most of the bottle, in other words, drank most of the bottle, and used only the dregs. Uh, that meant starting off with a small volume of sweet and strong black tea and ramping up like you would do if you were building up yeast from dregs. So that may wow. be good advice if you're starting small, because it took a long time for mine to show a lot of activity. And I think if I started off with a smaller volume of tea, you know, I would have had more activity sooner, and then I could have added more tea as I went along maybe, so... That's, well, your audience, your audience is so interactive, man. This is great. I yeah, can't believe all this. Yeah. Um, he says he eventually ramped up to a two-liter mason jar. A paper towel and a rubber band is all you need for a lid. Uh, after fermentation, I like to pour two-thirds of it into another jar with some guava or other juice and then fill some bottles. The juice adds some flavor and carbonation. So that sounds tasty. That's crafty. Wow. That's really getting in there. Dan says... Uh, uh, he posted a picture of his kombucha starter. He said, right behind you, James, 1032 original gravity. I used honey instead of table sugar. Nice. So there you go. That's another approach you can do. Uh, Big Daddy Ale uh, says, that's how I started my mother. Well, <laughs> sounds like a personal issue. Wait a minute. Issue. Hold on a second. Go back. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's how I. Ale. It's that's how I met my mother, wasn't it? That's a, <laughs> or that's how I met your mother. Ah, oh, oh dear. Uh, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> A mother is another word for SCOBY if we haven't said that yet. So so Big Daddy Yale is saying that that's, you know, I'm on the right track there, according to him. Thomas says, hey, James, if a SCOBY doesn't start to appear in 7 to 10 days, check the pH. And if it's below 3.6, remove the whole top and replace with a high or a tight weave cloth. From there, start to taste it every day or so as it will start to produce acetic acid as a result of the oxygen, which is also needed to create the pellicle. Uh, if you have any questions, he'd be happy to, happy to help. So there you go. Oh, he's, he's the brewer for Dr. Hop's Kombucha Beer. And, and he says uh, he's been listening to us uh, since he got started brewing. So there you go. You wow. Know, payback. Dr. Hop's. It's payback. That's great, man. Wow. The good stuff. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Thomas. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, Sharon says, would like some, please. Uh, Sharon, make your own. And <laughs> <laughs> Andrew says, uh, oh, he's posted a picture of, uh, of his uh, kombucha with several layers of uh, scoby or mother in there. It says it gets to a point where you just don't know what to do with all the scobies that keep growing in each batch. Well, give them to Sharon. Sharon needs something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sharon, Sharon, you can come over to my place and have uh, have some kombucha. There, James is there. Horrible. You go. <laughs> well, my mine's still working. <laughs> Michael says uh, posts a picture of his, uh, and he says it will work. So uh, he apparently used the same approach that I did. <clears throat> um, um, my I've got ginger ginger kombucha in, in the back of my throat here. Uh, Tyler says, I've done this with that very same type of kombucha to make a scoby. You definitely want that ball of snot, as you referred to. (laughs) However, it seems that you have an airlock on the container. I believe you want to allow oxygen into it. So there you go. I see. After all this, I took the I took the airlock off and I put the put the uh, paper towel on uh, and it seemed to improve the activity. Um, So oxygen is key there. Yeah, apparently so. Apparently. Uh, you know, the, the, there, some of the, the microorganisms in there like oxygen, you know, and, and I don't know if some, I don't know if it's one of its uh, acetobacter, but I think that th- that's how you make uh, vinegar basically. And I think oxygen is, is a component in that. <laughs> Peter Simons, uh, from Australia says, uh, misread the, the first time he thought it was a Scooby. So, <laughs> uh, nice. <laughs> Uh, Hunting, Huntington says uh, check the pH and keep the acidity high uh, with vinegar in the first batch. Once the mother grows, it will be acidic enough to retard mold without the ad- addition of vinegar. Uh, you're aiming for about 3 pH. That's good. Um, so good. Uh, there's, so, there's more, so there's more advice in there. So go to, that, uh, go to our Basic Brewing uh, video page on there. And, uh, you know, if you've got some information to, to ha- add, uh, jump in the discussion there. I think we could, we could all benefit from, from the feedback and from more additional uh, information. Yeah, absolutely. Man, I didn't, you know, I, when I got into this, I just thought it was going to be very simple. And it turns out to be extremely scientific. And I guess it makes sense because you're dealing with bacteria and, you know, lactobacillus, all kinds of different, uh, you know, wild yeasts and bacteria. So um, there's a lot to it. And I'm sure that these companies that have been doing this for a long time have uh, been experimenting for years in order to get this down. And it turns out this, uh, you know, kombucha is ancient. I mean, back in, uh, I don't know, was it 331 A.D. or something like that? It was invented in China or they think that's where they first discovered it. So, yeah, it's, wow. it's, been, it's been around a while. That's one old mother. It is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nicely done, James. <laughs> There's probably a lot of mother jokes that we could get into. Uh, <laughs> and if this were beer instead of kombucha, we probably would have. Uh, but <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure we would. <laughs> well, Phil, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I had a blast. And uh, we keep in touch. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, I've, I've got you added to my Stitcher list. Uh, under food, so uh, you know every time you you post a new episode. Of course, now the the pressure's on because uh, you know people are going to be waiting for new episodes now. It is. You know what? I, I, I sometimes wonder why am I doing this to myself? You know, now people are going to want me to to you know produce shows. It's not like that. Yeah, I enjoy doing this, so I'm absolutely uh, ready to go. I've got a lot to say, a lot of catching up to do, 
I just hope that people are able to tolerate how much I have to say. <laughs> and maybe you can urge uh, Paula Dean to come out of retirement. You know, I miss her so much. I really do. <laughs> it's guaranteed material. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she is. She oh. is. It, it's like a gift. <laughs> All right, Phil. It's been a blast. I appreciate it. Thank you, James. Thanks again to Phil. My kombucha is doing very well. It's been a few days since we talked. Uh, it's been in the in the jar for about a week and a half now, and uh, it has a nice scoby floating on the top. Uh, and I took a taste this morning, and it is nicely tart, but still a little sweeter than I prefer. So I plan to uh, leave it in there just a few more days. And then uh, ex uh, transfer most of it to another uh, vessel and experiment with a dry hopping. And uh, my goal is to, to get back with Phil in the future to trade samples and compare notes. So stay tuned. If you have brewing questions in the meantime, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com. Or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. You can find our log books where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. And thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that are purchased through the link are Scratch Free, Scrub Daddy, Pack of Four, and Yo Nana's Frozen Healthy Dessert Maker. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We'll greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association or subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Music.